And thank you so much for joining us for our next panel on how to protect our care workers and our restaurant workers. I'm Chabeli Carazana. I'm the economy reporter with the 19th, and I'm joined by two wonderful panelists. I'm so excited to be here with them. Uh, Saru Jayaraman is the president of One Fair Wage, a national co coalition advocating for eliminating the subminimum tipped wage for workers, for tipped workers, and pushing for a living wage for all workers. Thank you so much for joining us, Saru. And I, Ben Koo, is the co-founder and executive director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and co-director of Caring Across Generations, two organizations that are really working to advocate for better protections for care workers and family caregivers. Thanks so much for having, for being here with us. I'm so excited to talk to you. And especially in this moment, I sort of wanted to put everyone kind of where we are now. I mean, some of the issues that we've been seeing with restaurant workers and care workers have been around for a really, really long time. You know, before the pandemic helped to elevate those stories, care workers were among the lowest paid workers in the country. They often lack labor protections, basic benefits, paid time off, protections against harassment. Similarly, restaurant workers were also among the lowest paid, working in a two-tier system that, put, that puts starting wages for tipped workers as low as $2.13 um, at the federal level. And it's really built on this long legacy of severe sexual harassment, discrimination, and racism. Both are fields that are dominated by women and particularly women of color. More than 90% of home health aides are women, for example. About 70% of servers are women. So that's the context that we were in right before this moment and then the pandemic, right? So these workers have been thrust into essential positions, many without protective gear, without hazard pay or support if they got sick. The COVID experience presented a platform for a national conversation, I think, you know, led by organizers like the two of you on the ground to fight for better protections in the short term. And to completely reimagine the way we treat these workers in the long term, the way we look at this work. I think in all of the horror of the pandemic, it's also created an opportunity, perhaps unlike any we've ever had, to change the way we as a nation treat our most essential workforce. So with that, I really wanted to start sort of centering um, the workers who have endured so much during this pandemic. I was hoping you could each share a story of a worker you know, Saru, or a care worker you know, Aijen, that sort of represents the unique challenges that uh, these workers have faced during this time. Do you want to go first, Aijen? Sure. And this is such a great conversation and so timely as we're coming out of Women's History Month. And given everything that's happening, it is a huge moment for all of our work and for women and women of color in the economy. So thank you for hosting us. And ladies got to get paid. <laughs> I mean, bottom line, full stop. Um, but the story that came to mind as you were talking is a story of a home care worker in Texas named Susie Rivera, who has been working as a home care worker for 40 years. And she's 62 now. And she used to work 100 hours per week. And now with COVID and reduced hours. She's working about 60 hours a week and she supports a family of six on her minimum wage income. And it, she's been faced with just a series of impossible choices where she's constantly having to navigate, um, paying for more safer modes of transportation to and from her clients. She knows her clients are counting on her as their lifeline especially in this social distanced world where you have older people and people with disabilities who are incredibly isolated and also really vulnerable to the virus itself, making sure that they're safe. Meanwhile, she's got a family and kids at home and a partner who also needs care. And so just on every level, having to navigate impossible choices with just very little power and resources. I, and, I, and that's kind of how I think about this time for essential workers like her. It's like the burden of safety and the burden of saving our economy is falling on the shoulders of the women and women of color who have the least amount of power and resources to be able to navigate it all. And I think impossible choices is a good way to sort of describe this position because it's not like there is this 
menu of options for these workers who are, are really sort of put in, in these really difficult positions. Um, and I know that's probably been something you've heard as well, Saru. Yeah, for sure. Um, just like you said, the pandemic definitely exacerbated issues that frankly were we, what we are calling pre-existing conditions in these industries prior to the pandemic. So um, prior to the pandemic, the restaurant industry was one of the largest and fastest growing industries with the absolute lowest paying jobs, as you said, largely because of the money power and influence of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association, which lobbied since emancipation of slavery to keep uh, basically black people and women from getting a wage and instead have them live entirely on tips. And we went from a $0 wage at emancipation for a largely woman of color industry to now $2.13 an hour. And even prior to the pandemic, that sub minimum wage for workers who earn tips, who are mostly women, waitresses working in really casual restaurants, was a source of poverty, economic instability, and sexual harassment. In fact, the highest rates of sexual harassment of any industry because they were having to tolerate inappropriate customer behavior to feed their families and tips. And so with the pandemic, I can share the story of Shelly Ortiz. She's a worker in uh, Arizona, in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, you know, like so many other workers, about 6 million workers in the restaurant industry lost their jobs. One in four people who lost their jobs during the pandemic was in the restaurant industry. So it's a huge industry, it's 14 million workers. So, uh, and just complete shutdown during the pandemic meant that about 6 million workers lost their jobs, including Shelly. And like so many others, she had a really tough time getting unemployment insurance because in most states, some minimum wage workers were told that their wages were too low to qualify for benefits. So couldn't get any benefits uh, and then was forced to go back to work before she really felt safe because what Shelly knows, which the CDC finally came out and reported is that the restaurant, restaurant workplaces are the most dangerous place to be. Adults are twice as likely to get COVID eating in a restaurant, let alone working in a restaurant. It's a closed environment where everybody has their mask off uh, and what Shelley reports, like so many other workers, is that we already had the highest rates of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment went way up during the pandemic. They were asked to do so much more for so much less. They were asked to enforce social distancing and mask rules on the very same customers from whom they had to get tips at a time when she says tips are down 50 to 75% because sales are down. But worst of all, she said, all day, every day, men are asking her to take her mask off so they can judge her looks and her tips on that basis. And in her case in particular, she tells a story of a couple walking into her restaurant, sitting down. She describes herself as a shorter, voluptuous woman. She said that the husband throughout the meal kept saying, take off your mask so I don't have to look at your breasts all night. You better take off your mask so I can look at your face rather than your boobs. I'm so glad I'm sitting at this level. I can just look at your boobs all night unless you take off your mask take off your mask, take off your mask, take. We heard from so many hundreds of women that they were told constantly, take off your mask so we can see how cute you are before we decide how much to tip you that we ended up calling it masculine harassment. And it's taken this issue of a sub-minimum wage from being an issue of gender, economic, racial injustice to really being a matter of life and death. You know, I've actually, I actually talked to Shelly a few weeks ago um, and she relayed that story to me. and. I I mean, it's shock. What you feel is shock because it's it, it it's unbelievable to to some degree that you know people are going about treating workers in this way, and then but then you hear how many stories, how many how often those stories come about, and and perhaps we shouldn't be so shocked because it's something that has, like you said, been in this industry for a really long time and certainly exacerbated by the pandemic. You know, one thing Shelly told me was she felt, you know, like maybe this conversation was starting to shift a little bit this year and there was an opportunity there. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask you both about that, how this past year has elevated the work that each of you do cr and created sort of this broader awareness that we all now, you know, hopefully are having about what is left to be done to sort of create more equitable workplaces for restaurant and care workers? And how are these conversations changing? And what are you most sort of emboldened by as, as you continue to do this work in this context? I'm wondering what you're thinking on that, Saru. Yeah, my God, everything changed. I'm sure Aijin can say, talk about how it changed in the, it, for us, like 
oh my God, everything changed. Um, the, the worker organizing and how workers think about their situations changed. Employers and how they're thinking about the situation changed. And then of course, elected officials and what they're doing about it changed. So on the worker side, um, like the National Domestic Workers Alliance, we started a relief fund uh, and, you know, <laughs> I had been organizing restaurant workers for 18 years prior to that, got to a point where we had maybe amassed 30,000 workers in our membership. In one moment of creating a relief fund, we had a new base of 240,000 workers. 240,000 workers applied for relief. Shelly was one of them. And we instantly started organizing them. And never in my 20 years in, with those 30,000 workers had I heard so many workers saying, we just shouldn't go back to work without a full minimum wage. We just, it's not, it's not worth it. The risk is too high. The tips are too low, forget it. And so we organized strikes last year for the first time um, and all kinds of actions. I mean, workers were are frustrated, angry, ready to fight, not taking the baloney that's coming at them from the National Restaurant Association. So that was that changed. And then in response to that new activity and workers lifting their voices, employers, many employers changed their mind. We were approached over the last year by several hundred restaurant owners that changed their mind on these issues, either because they were moved by what their workers were experiencing or they were moved by the murder of George Floyd uh, to say, we got to end this legacy of slavery and this source of inequity. Um, or frankly, they couldn't get their workers to come back to work because so many were basically striking. They couldn't get their workers to come back to work without paying them a full minimum wage. So employers changed their mind. And then all of that led to elected officials seeing things differently, I think. You know, Biden-Harris campaign endorsing not only a $15 minimum wage, but elimination of the sub-minimum wage for tipped workers, workers with disabilities and youth, and then prioritizing that before even inauguration saying it would be part of the COVID package. And even though it wasn't part of the COVID package, clearly prioritizing getting this done. And now we need, now, now is the moment where, you know, we have to deliver for all these women who've come forward, have lifted their voices, who've been on strike, who've been at, who voted for the first time, as I'm sure Aijin can tell you too. I mean, we, I think we've talked about the same thing, Aijin, that you've been doing this work for such a long time. And this, this year, I mean, you know, so often it takes an enormous disaster sometimes for us to sort of wake up you know, as a country, can you point to the to the moments where you've seen, okay, you know, this work is is really is really getting to people now. They're they're seeing the importance. Yeah, I mean, I think we had just accepted these conditions for so long as a society, and we needed a big, big disruption and shakeup in order to actually like look again at our a country, our economy, our world, and. And I think that this shakeup, right, that turned our lives and our work upside down, created an opening. And I know, you know, Saru and I have been in the <laughs> in the trenches together for two decades. And I will say that the way that this conversation about what work is essential and um, an essential work at all as a frame um, has really opened up a conversation about how much work in our economy is so undervalued and unsafe and in a way that you know hasn't happened for decades and is so long overdue and people are starting to realize these are jobs that are held by women and women of color and we have not protected these workers and it turns out they're essential to our safety and our health and our well-being and our future and so that opening on top of the fact that everybody was at home with their kids crawling all over them on the zoom screens and trying to help their kids with special learning needs figure out how to navigate online learning and their parents getting evacuated from nursing homes that were being ravaged by the COVID pandemic. And all of a sudden people realize the fact that we don't have a care system or infrastructure to support our ability to take care of the people we love is actually so dangerous and so unsustainable. And so this idea that 
caregiving is something that we need support around and we need policy change around suddenly came to the forefront. And I think the difference between care infrastructure and roads and bridges and tunnels is that it involves a lot of people, especially women who provide those services who don't have good jobs and yet are essential. And so we're now looking at, okay, so if we're going to recover from this crisis, what's it going to take? And how do we do it in a way that addresses the pre-existing conditions that Saru talked about so that women actually have a fair opportunity for dignified work in this economy and things like investing in the care economy became a conversation like never before. Things like making care jobs, home care jobs, child care jobs, good jobs became something that everybody was like, yes, that's essential. And the thing about the care economy that has been really powerful is that people are recognizing that investing in the jobs that these workers hold is not just good for those workers and their families, but it's the kind of infrastructure that enables restaurant workers, public sector workers, teachers, everybody else to get back to work. So it has kind of a double benefit. And I think so much of the work that we as women do in this economy is that the ripple effects and benefits of the work that we do in our contributions is like exponential, but we're never supported and protected in the work that we do. And so this is a moment to change all of that. I really believe this, this exact moment is our time. And I think it's also the moment to the point of our conversation for ladies to get paid. So, I, <laughs> and, you know, I want to talk about that because the conversation around the minimum wage, I think, has really exploded in particular over uh, this last year. And um, I, I wanted to sort of set the stage for that a little bit, if you could, sorry to talk about the one fair wage proposal briefly and give everyone kind of an idea of, of what it is. Seven states have adopted it so far, um, and how it, the dynamics of how the, our current system sort of builds in inequity. So I was hoping you could explain that, and also why there has been resistance from other states and federally up until this point. And then we'll get in a little bit more about the minimum wage um, and what's been going on in the past few months, which I know you've both been working on, but I wanted to hear um, from you on that, Saru. Sure. Um, so uh, the Raise the Wage Act, which passed actually the House in 2019, has been reintroduced in both the House and the Senate. It calls for a $15 minimum wage and full elimination of the subminimum wage for tipped workers, workers with disabilities, and youth. And um, the overall raise of the minimum wage to $15 is so critical right now. It is, it's so essential to jumpstart our economy. It's so essential for all the things that Ijin mentioned around valuing care workers and other workers uh, to make sure that they actually can do the work that we need them to do to support all other workers. On the tipped worker piece in particular, I think it's um, both about getting people to a place that they can afford and as you said, correcting structural and historical inequities. So, um, you know, the restaurant industry has been such a huge industry, 14 million workers prior to the pandemic, one in 10 Americans worked in restaurants prior to the pandemic. Uh, but it's been one of the lowest paying sectors for decades. And that's largely due to the money power and influence of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association. And uh, that trade lobby, which we call the other NRA, it represents the chains, the IHOPs, the Applebee's, has been around actually in various forms since emancipation of slavery. And, and this is a history I often tell, but there's a new component to it that we've learned in the last year, year and a half, that in many ways, I, I say this history that I'm about to share really, this is one of the original equal pay issues because prior to 1850, waiters were mostly men in the US and they got a full wage. There was not really much tipping, they got a full wage and they went on strike in 1850 in cities across the country for a higher wage. And in retaliation, restaurants replaced men largely with women. So women entered the workforce as servers in large numbers just before emancipation. 
mind you, waiters were getting a wage and then emancipation happened. The restaurant industry wanted the ability to hire black people, black women in particular, not pay them anything, have them live entirely on tips, which was a mutation of tipping. Tipping had originated in Europe as an extra or bonus on top of the wage, but they wanted to mutate it in order to pay black people nothing. And so the wage went from a full wage when men were servers down to zero just as women and black people entered the workforce, which means you cannot understand the subminimum wage for tipped workers as anything other than a devaluation of black lives and women's work. That is all that it is. So that's why I say it's the original equal pay issue because you know, it's paying, not only paying women less, it's actually reducing the wage because it's women. And then we went from zero at emancipation, which became law, as I mentioned in 1938, all the way up to $2.13 an hour. It's been frozen. The subminimum wage for tipped workers has been frozen at $2.13 for 31 years, since 1991. Uh, largely because this is a mostly female industry of waitresses working in very casual restaurants. The law says they have to Make, up the, make it up to the full minimum wage in tips or their employers make up the difference, but that never happens. You, uh, uh, under Obama, the US Department of Labor reported an 84% violation rate with regard to employers actually ensuring that tips brought you to the full minimum wage. So it doesn't happen. Mostly these workers are just living off tips. It's the wild west. It's why so many of them didn't get unemployment insurance because you know, tips are often go unreported, not just by the workers, but by the employers too. And so a lot of them were, were screwed, couldn't get benefits. But today, here we are, $2 wage for tipped workers who are mostly women, and then $7.25 wage, which is not livable for anybody. And here we are trying to say, not only do we need to raise that $7.25 to $15, but we need to eliminate these subminimum wages that are truly about valuing some people as subhuman. That's what it is. You know, the, the minimum wage, the tip minimum wage is valuing black people and women as subhuman. The, the subminimum wage for disability, people with disabilities, I'm sorry, that cannot be understood. It's anything other than devaluing people with disabilities as subhuman. And same with youth, that's just ageism. And so it's time to end these subminimum wages. It's time to raise the overall minimum wage this is an opportunity to right historic wrongs and frankly, jumpstart the economy. And so in terms of uh, how it's moving through Congress, um, it has been introduced, passed through the House as part of the COVID bill, but didn't get into the COVID bill in the Senate. Eight senators have essentially in a straw poll vote that Senator Sanders put forward said no to it. Some are saying, well, maybe we could agree to it if there was a lesser wage for tipped workers. Some have said that's their top challenge with the, with the bill or their top uh, thing that they disagree with with the bill. And it's because they're being lobbied very heavily by the National Restaurant Association. And so what we're trying to say, President Biden, Senate Majority Leader Schumer, is you know we can talk about perhaps a longer timeline to get to 100%. We can talk about tax credits for employers. We can talk about other areas of negotiation but we cannot negotiate away a lesser wage for any of these workers because that would be tantamount to legalize gender pay and equity. Here we are today talking about the fact that women in America earn 83 cents on the man's dollar. For women of color, it's much lower. How could we legislate some workers at a percentage of the wage, 50 or 60 or 70%, and also be trying to at the same time supposedly close the gender pay gap? It's ludicrous. We have to ultimately end these uh, minimum wages in addition to raising the overall minimum wage. And to that point, you know, I think economists have come out to say, you know, there's a lot of literature on this topic in particular about the minimum wage, but a lot of it is saying, you know, this is one of the measures that could really reduce gender pay gaps because of the nature of who is most likely to be making lower wages and who's most likely to be to come up if that um, if the minimum wage were higher. And so I you know you talked a little bit about um, some of the work you're doing. Saru to you know talk to members of Congress. I was wondering, I Jen, you know what what that work has looked like for you in these past few months. You know, as Saru said, we did not see the minimum wage in the Senate package. And so there is an ongoing conversation about what that looks like. It was a big tension point um, in, in Congress this year as those negotiations were ongoing. And I think a lot of it to Saru's point about valuing this work, valuing care work. Um, we're, we're hearing sort of, there's there's a lot of different uh, ways in which 
I think this country uh, looks at care work and if a, if a, if a man uh, works with, uh, leaves as, uh, his job to help his wife uh, do the care work, he's, uh, he's applauded, right? That's wonderful. But then we devalue care workers and don't pay them very much, right? And, and if, a, if a mother has to leave work to care for her kids, that, that's, a, that, that, that's not treated in the same way. And so there is sort of that gender aspect there. I was hoping you can uh, tell us a little bit, Aijin, about the work you're doing around the minimum wage since that's such a big sticking point um, to, to creating that value. And especially now um, in the wake of that piece not being included in, in, in the American Rescue Plan. Well, it's just worth also saying that two thirds of all minimum wage workers are women. And these are women who are primary income earners and moms of small children. And I mean, it's it's a huge, huge um, source of inequity for sure. But I think a barrier to achieving economic mobility for literally millions upon millions of working people in this country. And we should have raised the minimum wage to $15 an hour 10 years ago. Literally this, at least 10 years ago for everyone and eliminated the subminimum wage decades ago. And I just think we are, we are catching up. And the fact that we still have members of Congress who are not there is, um, is really disheartening. It really is. And we have to get them there because I do know also with some of the, the incredible research that's come out that SARU's organization and others have, have shared is that the vast majority of American people want this. I mean, this is a popular issue. And so these members of Congress who are not supporting these measures are actually going against the will of the people who elected them, full stop. So they're going alongside the interests of this you know, multi-billion dollar lobby um, over the interests of voters. And that that just can't be acceptable in this day and age. And we are mobilizing around this issue along with the big investment in the care economy as a part of the jobs and recovery plan. We had um, a few weeks ago, we had more than 30,000 home care workers on the phone together for a teletown hall talking about the importance of mobilizing around raising the minimum wage and making care jobs good jobs. These two things go hand in hand. The average annual income of a home care worker in this country is $17,000 per year. We're just talking about a huge segment of our workforce. That's women and women of color who work incredibly hard and just cannot make ends meet and cannot take care of themselves. The irony of the fact that the people that we're counting on to take care of us and the people we love can't take care of their own loved ones on the wages that they earn. That's what has to change. And that's the story that domestic workers and care workers are organizing around and talking to members of Congress about like right now in real time. And we won't stop. We're not letting up. We are not giving up. We have more momentum than ever before, more champions because we did vote for our champions. <laughs> and, um, and, I, and I believe we can win, but it will require that all of us ladies who believe we should get paid, <laughs> organize and make it happen. Um, so I, you know, I'm very hopeful. We have power, we have momentum, we have champions and yeah, we have powerful opposition, but we always have, and that's never stopped us. And you have a package incoming from the administration. We're starting to hear some details about what that's going to include. And uh, I think it's really interesting. You mentioned it a little bit earlier of care as infrastructure, right? And we've been hearing you know, sort of that phrase a little bit more this year. And we have an infrastructure plan coming from the president that includes a care component. It's not just about roads. It's, uh, it's also about the care economy. And so I was hoping you could tell us um, the kind of work that you're doing with the administration. And uh, I know you're in contact with them about what this plan needs to include, what has to be in there and what you all feel like are the prongs that would build out this caregiving infrastructure. So it has three pillars to it. Um, and the big breakthrough around the president's vision for the care economy, there's actually three big breakthroughs. The first is that the care economy in and of itself being a part, a core pillar of the economic agenda 
not the women's agenda, not the kids agenda, but the economic agenda is a big breakthrough. That's never happened before. Um, the second piece being the holistic approach to it, right? That it's about childcare and it's about paid leave and it's about long-term care, especially in the home and community, right? Where so many people, especially people with disabilities who we've also already mentioned, are on these long wait lists to try to get services in the home and the community just so that they can live and work independently connected to their communities. That is a basic human right to be able to live at home and people with disabilities cannot realize that right without more care. And the third piece is about a care workforce that earns a living wage and has a real voice and economic security. Those are the pillars we want to think about care holistically and the infrastructure that families need holistically so that they can work knowing that their loved ones are in good hands. And um, and so we are pushing to ensure that that whole program is a part of the vision for jobs and recovery. Usually our issues are pitted against each other, like either child care or paid leave, either home care or paid leave. And, and we know that these are not interchangeable. Families need all of them. And we frankly deserve all of them and can only work and participate in the economic recovery if we have all of them. So we're trying to communicate that message and to make sure that we are front and center in how we think about rebuilding from a place of equity with women and women of color front and center. I want to come back to um, why we're having this conversation, why we want to protect these workers and, and create these policies. And these are big solutions that we're talking about. And I was hoping, you know, each of you could talk a little bit about you know, this seems like a critical moment to raise support for these policies that have received so much focus. Um, and, you know, I was wondering if you could lay out maybe some some ways, small and big, that folks can support these initiatives and these workers. Do you want to you want to go first, Saru? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, uh, well, first of all, we have to push uh, it, with the, with the minimum wage, we have to push on the eight senators who voted no, eight Democratic senators who voted no, um, and Schumer and Biden to make sure everybody knows, as I just said, that workers voted, women voted, women of color voted, not only for the first time, but really delivered this election, delivered the Senate majority in Georgia, delivered Biden the presidency in Michigan and Pennsylvania and Arizona delivered on this issue, because as Ajahn said, it's such a ridiculously popular issue. It's so overwhelmingly popular. So uh, we have to let them know that we expect them to deliver. Um, you can do that in our case by going to our website, onefairwage.com and taking act. You can just hit a button there and it'll let you write a letter to legislators telling them we need to get this across the finish line and it has to be done this year. It has to be done uh, leaving tipped workers at 100%. We need $15 an hour, nothing less. These are the things that we need to communicate. Uh, and can, if you don't have another way to do it, you can do it easily through our website. Um, in our case, another thing is helpful, which is um, as we all start returning to eating out or at least ordering from, from restaurants, um, we need everybody to be communicating with restaurant owners that we want to see a different industry coming back. We need to see a different industry coming back, one in which workers are paid. And so every time you eat out or order from somewhere, you know, you can, you can talk to uh, the employer or the manager of the restaurant and say, hey, I love this place. I love the food. I love the service. I want to know that you are part on the right side of history working with the folks that are fighting for change in this industry. I want to know that people are paid in this restaurant a full minimum wage. Um, and you can point them to the website that lists the restaurants that are doing the right thing, which is highroadrestaurants.org. Um, so those are two you know, very concrete things to engage legislators and employers. And then the last thing is just telling everybody you know, educating everybody you know that um, if we're gonna resolve gender pay equity in this country, if as Ijen says, ladies are gonna get paid, we have to demand it. 
you know, nothing is going to come without our demanding it. We have to demand. We, you know, we, we are essential workers who delivered for people in the pandemic. And now we need people to stand with us and to get, get, get a raise because we just can't live otherwise. So the third thing is to let everybody, you know, help us communicate to legislators, communicate to employers that time's up, things got to change. Those are great. Those are great. Hi, Jen, how, how can we support care workers? So I'll also give three options and we hope everybody will do all six. <laughs> um, the first is to call someone in your life who is a caregiver, whether they're a family caregiver, taking care of a family member or a professional caregiver and just show them some love. Tell them that you appreciate them and you see them. Um, the second is to call and try to set up a virtual meeting with your member of Congress or someone at that office to tell them how important it is to you that caregiving and increases in the minimum wage are included in the jobs and recovery plan that's coming next. Um, and caregiving is everything from child care support to paid leave to long-term care in the home and the community. I mean, that for members of Congress to hear from their constituents, there's literally nothing more powerful than that. And it's really easy to set up a meeting. Um, so that's the second thing. And then the third thing is that we are helping to organize a big summit about caregiving on April 10th called the Care Can't Wait National Summit. And if you tune in, it'll be from 12 to 2 Eastern. Tune in to hear the incredible stories of caregivers and the people that they support all over the country in this pandemic, have a chance to honor them and also to take action to support them going forward. Um, so you can find out more about that at caringacrossgenerations.org. Well, I think I might have to tune in to that one specifically. Thank you all both so much. These are wonderful ideas that I hope uh, some folks will listen to and, and take to heart. And I want to thank you also for all of the important work that you've been doing. You know, this has been a really, really, really tough year. And, you know, it's, it's really tough to be in the middle of that work and seeing these people that you're fighting for who are, who are really struggling. And I think uh, if there's a takeaway here, it's we need to talk more about this. We need to keep this conversation going because so much of this problem is around invisibility and that this work has been invisible and undervalued. And so we have to raise it up and hope that these ladies get paid. Thank you both so much. Yeah.